Hello. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely to see so many of you here. You may be slightly surprised to see me here rather than our chairman, Professor Ian Torrance, who sends his apologies. Wearing one of his other hats, Ian is presiding over the graduations at the University of Aberdeen all this week in his role as pro-chancellor of that institution. When we first uh, planned this programme for 2019, we did not, in fact, know that Ian Torrance was going to be our new chairman and that he would not be in Edinburgh during the third week of June. He very much regrets not being able to be here this evening and thereby missing what promises to be a particularly interesting talk. We will do better with our dates for next year. <laughs> the name of Dr. Thomas Richardson, who has kindly agreed to talk to us this evening, will be familiar to many of you. He is currently Eudora Welty Professor of English at the Mississippi University for Women, which in spite of its name, and slightly confusingly, is a public co-educational, have I got that right? Sorry. <laughs> University in Columbus, Mississippi. Dr. Richardson has only fairly recently stepped down as provost and vice president for academic affairs of that university in order to be able to bring to completion a long-term research project, which I will come back to. Dr. Richardson's publications have mainly focused on the contributions which various 19th century authors have made to contemporary literary magazines, such as James Hogg and Robert Louis Stevenson. And one of these publications is in fact a chapter in a book edited by Caroline McCracken Flesher, who is, of course, well known to this club, both as a speaker and as a regular visitor. Given Tom's interest in 19th century literary magazines, it may not come as a great surprise that the long-term research project, which I have just mentioned, is the first scholarly edition of the works of John Gibson Lockhart, of which Tom is the series editor. This edition is due to be published shortly here in Edinburgh by the Edinburgh University Press. And how could we possibly have anyone who is better qualified to talk to us tonight about Scott and his son-in-law and biographer, John Gibson Lockhart? Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you for the invitation to talk with you about my work on John Gibson Lockhart, Sir Walter Scott's son-in-law and early biographer. One of the projects that I have begun working on during my sabbatical research this spring is a selection of Lockhart's letters, and of course Scott and the Scott family will play a major role in that edition. Like Scott, Lockhart was a prolific letter writer and many of Lockhart's letters offer detailed insights into the literary and political activities of the time, as well as personal reports on the domestic lives of the extended Scott family. This evening, I would like to present an overview of Lockhart's literary career, interweaving comments about the professional and personal relationships between Lockhart and Scott, especially as represented in their correspondence. Lockhart was born in 1794 the son of a Church of Scotland minister, the Reverend Dr. John Lockhart, and his second wife, Elizabeth Gibson. Dr. Lockhart was minister of the parish church of Kembus Nethan in Lanarkshire at the time of Lockhart's birth, but moved to the College Kirk of Blackfriars in Glasgow when Lockhart was two years old. So John grew up in Glasgow. Lockhart was a brilliant student with a particular interest in languages he enrolled in Glasgow University in 1805 at age 11, 
and was awarded a Snell exhibition to Balliol College and Oxford University in 189, where he earned a first class degree in classics. He also learned modern languages, German, Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and dabbled, to use his term, in Danish, Swedish, and Anglo-Saxon. Lockhart described himself in his youth as language mad, and while still at Balliol, he tried unsuccessfully to interest the London publisher, John Murray, in publishing his literary translations. Lockhart's early interest in writing extended to novels, and in 1814, he wrote to his friend Jonathan Christie about a novel in progress. I mean it chiefly as a receptacle of anecdotes and observations I have made concerning the state of the Scotch, chiefly their clergy and elders. It is to me wonderful how the Scottish character has been neglected. He again considered approaching John Murray, but he wrote instead to the Edinburgh publisher, Archibald Constable, and again was unsuccessful. Very soon, though, Lockhart read Scott's Waverley, and he decided that it would be best to let his novel, quote, sleep a year or two. <laughs> Lockhart went to Edinburgh in 1815 to study law. He spent a short time practicing law and served as an advocate on the Highland Circuit. Although his early literary pursuits faltered, he began a literary career in earnest in Edinburgh when he became connected with the publisher William Blackwood who in 1817 sent him on a literary tour to Germany, where he met Goethe and other German literati. Lockhart's first book-length publication was a result of that tour, a two-volume translation of Friedrich Schlegel's lectures on the history of literature, ancient and modern. Lockhart was a major contributor to Blackwood's new literary venture, Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, which was first published in April 1817, under the title, The Edinburgh Monthly Magazine. Lockhart wrote or had a hand in more than 200 works in Blackwoods. The vast majority of his works are significant, incisive works of literary criticism, consistently perceptive and authoritatively written, covering a broad range of topics, including Greek tragedy and poetry, German and American literature, and the major contemporary poets. He wrote important essays about the genres of the novel and periodical criticism in general, and it could be argued that he set the standard for literary criticism of the Romantic period. His Blackwood's works include a substantial body of both uh, satirical and serious verse. Additionally, during his time with Blackwood's, he published a fictitious account of Edinburgh and Glasgow literary, cultural, legal, <coughs> political, and religious scenes, Peter's letters to his kinfolk, and four novels, among other works. In late 1825, Lockhart became editor of the Quarterly Review in London. He wrote nearly 120 articles for the Quarterly, in addition to directing the political, literary, and social focus of the Quarterly, as a very active editor. During this time with the John Murray firm, he also wrote a biography of Robert Burns for Constable's Miscellany series, and he served as editor of Murray's series of inexpensive publications, The Family Library, for which he wrote the first volumes, a two-volume biography of Napoleon. He oversaw the publication of Murray's Colonial and Home Library, he edited Scott's poetry with notes and Scott's miscellaneous prose works, both published by Robert Cattle, and he contributed significantly to the notes for Murray's 17-volume edition of Byron's works and to the revision of jo revisions of John Wilson Croker's edition of Boswell's Life of Johnson. He continued to write occasionally for Blackwoods, and he revised his novels for the reissue of the Blackwoods Standard Novels series. His volume of translations of ancient Spanish ballads was republished by Murray in an elaborately illustrated edition, one of the first examples of chromolithography in book publishing. He also published his most ambitious work at this time, his biography of Sir Walter Scott. In October 1818, Lockhart was invited by Scott to visit Abbotsford 
a visit that ultimately led to life-altering events for both men. In January 1820, Lockhart paid his formal visit to Mrs. Scott, who, as Scott wrote to his son Walter, would have liked a little more style, but she has no sort of objections to the marriage of Lockhart and the elder Scott daughter, Sophia. In a letter to Lady Abercorn in March 1820, Scott announced the upcoming marriage and described Lockhart to her as a man of uncommon talents, indeed of as promising a character as I know. He is highly accomplished, a beautiful poet and fine draftsman, and what is better of a most honorable and gentlemanlike in disposition. He is handsome besides, and I like everything about him except that he is more grave and retired than I like particularly but it is better than the opposite extreme. Lockhart at that time was also a volunteer with the militia that was engaged in putting down the radical uprisings in the west of Scotland, another point in Lockhart's favor. Scott wrote to Lord Melville in December 1819, Lockhart is turned a zealous yeoman in Lord Elko's troop, which is a superb one. It is odd enough that under my personal disqualifications, I began life by raising light dragoons, and now in the autumn of my days am embodying sharpshooters, or at least arranging all matters to prepare such a force. Lockhart wrote several letters to Sophia about the exploits of the troops. For example, on Wednesday, April 12th, 1820, he wrote, there seems now to be no doubt that there has had been a serious and well-organized plan for a rising on Thursday last. On Wednesday evening, the greater part of the roads leading from Glasgow were in the hands of the radicals for near two hours, and various places of encampment in the neighborhood were resorted to by the weavers, etc., from the village. The drum was beat, such was their audacity, within a mile of the barracks. But on the whole, the arrival of so many broad-backed farmers, etc., had the effect of chilling very much the ardor of all but the very hottest, and seeing themselves not joined by so many as they had expected, the spirit of all soon began to subside. In a hurt, they returned home dispirited, and many of them were immediately arrested. And indeed, the jails are all full now. I think it is likely we shall not be home till towards the end of the week, but we are all kept in total darkness, for mystery is in all professions, but I see it is the essence of the military. Lockhart did return to Edinburgh from his Western campaign within a few days. On April 29th, 1820, John and Sophia were married, and so Lockhart became connected with the literary and political circles of one of the most influential people of his time, and certainly received a boost to his literary interests. Scott, of course, gained a son-in-law, grandchildren, and his most ardent long-term promoter. Scott was pleased with the match, as already noted, but he also recognized in Lockhart, somewhat prophetically, Lockhart's usefulness in managing Scott's estate. Scott wrote to J.B.S. Morritt, Lockhart is a very handsome young man and remarkably clever, well disposed and well principled. To me, as it seems neither of my sons have a strong literary turn, the society of a son-in-law possessed of learning and talent must be a very great acquisition and relieve me from some anxiety with respect to a valuable part of my fortune consisting of copyrights, which though advantageous in my lifetime, might have been less so at my decease, unless under the management of a person acquainted with the nature of such property. Scott's only concern about Lockhart, which he would mention in several letters, was Lockhart's fondness for personal satire. He wrote to Sir James Russell about Lockhart's talents and character, but added, I hope he will abate his satirical vein, which entre nous gives more pain to others than is worth the laurels which are won by it. And in another letter to Marit wrote, Lockhart's powers of personal satire are what I most dread on his own account. 
It is an odious accomplishment and most dangerous, and I trust I have prevailed on him to turn his mind to something better. There was good reason for Scott to be concerned about Lockhart's skills in and fondness for personal satire. For Lockhart became embroiled in lawsuits and threatened lawsuits in the associations with the early issues of William Blackwood's new iteration of his magazine. Blackwood was dissatisfied with the direction of the Edinburgh Monthly Magazine, and after only six issues, he dismissed his editors, who went to work for Archibald Constable, and he renamed his magazine Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine. Personal satire was a prominent feature of Blackwood's revitalized magazine, most notably in the first number of October 1817 in the Chaldee Manuscript. The Chaldee Manuscript, a satire on the publishing rivalry between Blackwood and Constable in the style of the authorized version of the Bible, was written by James Hogg as a humorous literary sport. But Hogg's original was revised and expanded with added venom as Lockhart wrote to his friend Christie, the history of it is this. Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, sent up an attack on Constable the bookseller, respecting some private dealings of his with Blackwood. Wilson and I liked the idea of introducing the whole panorama of the town and that sort of dialect. We drank punch one night from eight till eight in the morning, Blackwood being by with anecdotes, and the rest is before you. In all, 135 verses were added to Hogg's original 46, including those that were most offensive. Two of the worst are characterizations of Charles Kirkpatrick Sharp and John Graham D.L. Sharp, a clergyman and historian, had disagreed with Blackwood over editorial control of Sharp's, Sharp's edition of James Kirkton's Secret and True History of the Church of Scotland in which Sharp provided unnecessarily disparaging views of the Covenanters, and which Blackwood finally declined to publish. Here is how Sharp is described in the Chaldee. But behold, while they were yet speaking, they heard a voice of one screeching at the gate, and the voice was a sharp voice, even like the voice of the unclean bird which buildeth its nest in the corner of the temple, and defileth the holy places. Sharp is described by Walter Scott in his journal. He was bred a clergyman, but did not take orders, owing, I believe, to a particular effeminacy of voice, which must have been unpleasant in reading prayers. Sharp's voice earned him the nickname of Cheeping Charlie. The representation of the DL in the Chaldee cost Blackwood 230 pounds in a lawsuit. DL, a lawyer and historian who wrote for Constable, had been permanently lamed from an injury as an infant. His character in the Chaldee is described as a beast of burden which Constable had in his courts to hew wood and carry water and to do all manner of unclean things. His face was likened to the face of an ape and he chattered continually, and his nether parts were uncomely. He skipped with the branch of a tree in his hand. He is a sinful thing, and speaketh abominably. His do doings are impure. Behold, he was born of his mother before yet the months were fulfilled, and the substance of a living thing is not in him, and his bones are like the potsherd, which is broken against any stone. In the alcohol-infused fueled enthusiasm for the Chaldee, Lockhart probably undermined his own character and reputation with the description of himself, coupled with the other scandalous articles in the October 1817 issue of which he was a part. In the original version, Hogg described Lockhart <coughs> as the dark wolf that delighted in the times of ancient days, which simply called attention to the dark features of his appearance and his classical education. However, Lockhart himself changed his Chaldee description to, there came also from a far country the scorpion, which delighteth to sting the faces of men, that he might sting sorely the countenance of the man which is crafty, Constable, and of the two beasts, Constable Blackwood's former editors. 
Lockhart's scorpion reputation has had a long life. It was also in this issue that the first of the series of articles on the Cockney School of Poetry was published, a damning assessment of Lee Hunt and others, other writers linked to Hunt's name. Lockhart is most commonly maligned and vilified by modern critics for his role in the ad hominem attacks in the Cockney School articles. Especially galling to many readers is the fourth article in the series on the poetry of John Keats, which asserts that Keats was a talented young man whose training for a career in medicine had been disrupted by the poetical mania of the age, resulting in the, quote, calm, subtle, imperturbable, imper driveling idiocy of Endymion, and which concludes, for heaven's sake, young Sangrado, be a little more sparing of extenuatives and soporifics in your practice than you have been in your poetry. <laughs> Lockhart offered advice to Blackwood following the outcry over the October 1817 issue. Get Scott and you get everything. Be extremely cautious in giving even to him names or power unnecessary. Upon him depends Upon him, everything depends, for in any faculty meeting where literature is concer concerned, who dares stand against my Groby? Scott, of course, stayed out of the fray. Scott did try to steer Lockhart away from the personal attacks in his writing, and apparently had a positive influence on Peter's letters to his kinfolk, which was first published in July 1819. Lockhart published excerpts from his work in progress in the February and March 1819 issues of Blackwoods. Scott was impressed especially by the characterizations of the members of the legal profession, but he was concerned about what direction Lockhart might take his sketches and wanted to meet with Lockhart to encourage restraint before he went further with book publication. As Scott wrote to James Ballantyne, in so small a society as Edinburgh, there is great difficulty in speaking plain out, respecting character and, and appearance. And this was even more so in books than in magazines. Scott seems to have had some influence on both the tone and subject of Peter's letters. And on receiving a copy of the published work, wrote to Lockhart, the doctor has fully maintained his high character for force of expression, both serious and comic, and for acuteness of observation and his scalpel has not been idle, though his lenient hand has cut sharp and clean and poured balm into the, root, into the wound. When I think that at an age not much younger than yours, I knew Black, Ferguson, Robertson, Erskine, Adam Smith, John Hume, etc., and at least Saul Burns, I can appreciate better than anyone the value of a work which, like yours, would have handed down handed them down to posterity in their living colors. Dr. Morris ought to revive every half century to record the fleeting manner of the age and the interesting features of those who will be only known to posterity by their works. Even so, Lockhart and Blackwood faced a lawsuit from the Black Bull Inn in Edinburgh for the negative comments on it in Peter's letters. Controversy surrounding Lockhart and Blackwood's magazine continued for several years and at one point turned violent. John Scott, editor of the London Magazine, persisted in saying that Lockhart was the editor of Blackwood's and responsible for the magazine's meanness. Lockhart denied he was editor. Blackwood, in fact, was his own editor. But Scott would not believe him. Lockhart went to London to challenge Scott on the issue, including to a duel but Scott wouldn't see him or accept his challenge. The conflict continued, and Lockhart's friend Christie, who was a lawyer in London, went to see Scott. Scott and Christie dueled. Christie shot Scott, and Scott died a few days later. Sir Walter Scott was in London at the time of this duel, meeting regularly with Christie and writing to Lockhart frequently with updates. This death was the last straw for Walter Scott and Lockhart's magazine mischief. And he wrote to Lockhart on the 24th of February, 1821, to press him to give up Blackwoods.
Christy and I talked over the matter anxiously. It is his opinion as well as mine, and if either has weight with you, you will not dally with this mother of mischief any more. I make this my most earnest entreaty to you, and as it agrees with that of all your friends and well-wishers, I trust it will not be made in vain. Do not promise, but act, and act at once and with positive determination. Although Lockhart did not immediately sever ties with Blackwood's magazine, he directed most of his literary energies into other avenues, publishing his four novels in four years, Valerius in 1821, Adam Blair, 1822, Reginald Dalton, 1823, Matthew Wald, 1824, a lengthy biographical essay on Daniel Defoe for an edition of Robinson Crusoe, an edition of Don Quixote with his annotations and a biographical essay on Cervantes, and a book-length collection of his original translations of ancient Spanish ballads. Scott generally had a high opinion of Lockhart's work during this period. He praised the novels and thought Lockhart's Don Quixote superseded all other editions. He called Lockhart's Spanish poetry beautiful translations which, to speak truth, are much finer than the originals. Scott's fondness for the Spanish ballads, however, did not prevent him from a friendly parody of the work. The opening stanza of Zara's earrings from the collection runs, my earrings, my earrings, they've dropped into the well, and what to say to Musa I cannot, cannot tell. Twas thus Grenada's fountain by spoke Al Buharaz's daughter. The well is deep, far down they lie beneath the cold blue water. To me did Musa give them when he spake his sad farewell, and what to say when he comes back, alas, I cannot tell. Scott wrote to Daniel Terry on the 18th of June in 1823, waiting to receive the marbles and the chimney grapes for Abbotsford. My marbles, my marbles, oh, what must now be done? My drawing room is finished off, but marbles there are none. My marbles, my marbles, I fancied them so fine. The marbles of Lord Elgin were but a joke to mine. <laughs> Lockhart moved to London late in 1825 to become editor of the Quarterly Review. After that, Lockhart's letters to Scott became much more frequent, and the letters are full of domestic, literary, business, and political news and gossip. Lockhart corresponds with Scott about articles for the Quarterly, and Scott published 11 articles under Lockhart's editorship, for which he was paid from 60 to 100 pounds each. Scott also wrote letters on demonology and witchcraft for Murray's family library, which was under Lockhart's supervision. Domestic news was an important, but not the dominant, subject of the correspondence. Lockhart wrote to Scott on January 1st, 1828, when daughter Charlotte was born. I have the pleasure to inform you that Sophia has this morning presented me with a New Year's gift of promise to wit a very plump little girl she had a short and easy time of it, and both are doing as well as possible. This is a great relief. The doctor has slept here for three weeks, and every day has been expectation and disappointment. Johnny, when I asked him if he thought the baby pretty, answered, shaking his head, not very. <laughs> the womankind dissent from this authority, however, and Walter has not yet declared to which opinion he inclines. I think newborn babes are all as like each other as so many oranges. <laughs> Much of the domestic correspondence, though, was more serious and was focused on the older son, Johnny's health. His pain, his treatments, his travel for warm weather, warm, dry weather, and Lockhart's efforts to put as positive a spin on his prognosis as possible. Lockhart wrote on July 9th, 1828, this day, Dr. Farr, Dr. Gooch, and Ferguson inspected and consulted about Johnny. The first named, as you know, as you probably know, considered as quite the highest authority on diseases of the lungs and liver. He is the same who attended Mr. Canning and is solely a consulting physician. 
The result is, he says, Johnny's lungs are affected superficially so as to produce a discharge of mucus, but not substantially, or were they alone the seat of the d disease, he would say, dangerously. The liver, he says, is slightly affected, and the original disease of the spine has so weakened all the mesenteric region that this must be considered as a most serious incident. He says he has seen children recover under circumstances of the same kind, more aggravated, bids us not despair in short. Should the child get worse again, he would recommend a trial of Hempstead Heath for air. He recommends little medicine, which I was glad to hear, having always suspected Dr. Yates of being too largely a poorer in of drudgery. This is all I can say for the present. Lockhart writes, too, about a busy social life. He and Sophia are in, invited to visit the artist David Wilkie to see his new work, some Italian paintings, and a set of Spanish objects. Lockhart described the new work in detail and commented on their beauty and grace, among the best of Wilkie's work. Lockhart also saw there Sir William Knighton, King George IV's personal secretary, who had gone to purchase works for the king. Lockhart also entertained James Hogg on his visit to London in early 1832. Here is James Hogg. He has come up to start, if he can, an edition of his works, a la Waverley. And as he has found a young raw bookseller, I fancy he will succeed in his start. He seems likely to be a great lion among the 10 pound interest. He dined here yesterday with Theodore Hook who celebrated his advent in an extempore canticle of great fun and made the tears chase each other down the furrowed cheeks of the great boar and his grinders gape in a most picturesque agony of delight. And Lockhart went to an Edward Irving service for the curiosity value, writing to Scott on December 5th, 1831. This morning, three horrid creatures are hanged for burking in London. London. And I had the satisfaction yesterday hearing the Reverend Edward Irving announce from the pulpit his opinion that the worst of the three was as pure in the sight of God as the holiest of that congregation. More sane than the wisest of them, I could well believe. I went to hear the unknown tongues, but was disappointed well, the spirit moved none of the gifted sisters, one, two, three, four, and five, as they are called in the pamphlets. And as it is said, the Kirk is to be shut up as a nuisance before next Sunday. I fear I shall never witness what another pious pamphlet speaks of as a glorious clash of tongue. There were at least 3,000 people present, and the whole reminded me of the first outburst of Quakerism. I think it very likely these fools may found a new sect. It was the political news, though, that dominated Lockhart's letters for the last six years of Scott's life. The Quarterly Review, of course, was Tory-oriented Tory in its politics, and Lockhart had an enthusiastic interest in the political news. He seemed especially interested in being first to get news to Scott of parliamentary affairs and of the political talk from among well-placed sources. Lockhart had high connections as Scott's son-in-law, as editor of the Quarterly Review, and as a friend of John Wilson Croker's. On Lockhart's going to London, Scott had written to Sir William Knighton to introduce Lockhart to him, and Knighton, whom Lockhart referred to as the invisible or the great unseen, from time to time summoned Lockhart to pass on information. Lockhart frequently attended parliamentary debates over major issues, especially the sessions leading up to the reform bill. At one point, Lockhart himself briefly considered standing for parliament. He wrote to Scott in May of 1830, during the last 12 months, I have one way and another cleared upwards of 5,000 pounds and do not perceive any reason that it should be otherwise next. Under these circumstances, do you think I should be justified in aspiring to a seat in the next House of Commons? One can hardly live so continually among those gamesters as I have been doing without wishing to take a hand sometimes. 
but I should feel no gratification in coming in otherwise than at liberty to play for myself. I would like to give just two examples of Lockhart's letters related to the politics of reform. Lockhart wrote to Scott on the 5th of March in 1831 about their old friend and political and literary rival, Francis Jeffrey, former editor of the Edinburgh Review, who was then in Parliament. Last night I witnessed Jeffrey's debut and should hardly, except in one or two pretty paragraphs, have recognized our old acquaintance. He was feeble, cold, and powerless in manner, and not a bit of his voluble sarcasm of other days, examining into first principles like some professor, and in short, it was a baddish article, not at all a speech. He was listened to at first with profound attention, but at last wore out patience and was all but coughed down. Not having heard him for five or six years, I could not but be terribly struck with the contrast, and coupling what everyone felt, viz. an intolerable smell of ether, while he spoke with the, story, with the stories current, I must suspect there is reason to blame certain indulgences for this decay of the physique. Croker got up and dissected both Jeffrey and the bill to a house at first unwilling and repulsive with a force of sarcasm and also eloquence eloquence that presently told with prodigious effect. God knows how it is to end. Ten days later, Lockhart wrote again in terms that sound remarkably modern. I would have written sooner had I had anything very comfortable to tell, but on the contrary, every day seems to render the substantial success of the bill more certain. Many who a week ago spoke the most vigorously on the side of opposition now intimate their belief that the only wise course is to let the scheme go to committee and reserve themselves for a petty war of tearing and pruning. The truth is that in spite of all the efforts of the disinterested, the three parties of Tories, the Dukes, Peels, and Sir Charles Wetherills remain in disunion, do not conceal their having ranged, ranged them for the knots under one banner from wholly distinct motives, and even as to this business, consult not together in private confidence. Never was a man less adapted as to his manners than Peel for conciliating and winning back, where there was much to forgive on both sides. If he has really tried, he has failed. I think the Duke has been too proud to try at all. And now, now all I hear, hear of is their having subscribed to set up a newspaper. <laughs> Lockhart's letters also reveal a man who was generous and attentive to the needs of his friends and acquaintances. For example, he wrote to Scott about the financial difficulties of his literary friend, R.P. Gillies, and how he was frustrated by Gillies' debts and his lack of initiative. Lockhart expected Gillies to be arrested, but noted, when that occurs, I shall of course take care of his wife and children until there is time for having an answer from Lord Gillies. Lockhart did the same for William McGinn's wife and daughter when they were in financial difficulty and advocated for James Hogg and a long list of other writers and artists for assistance from the Royal Society of Literature as well as for government pensions. Thomas Carlyle would later describe Lockhart as a person of sense, good breeding, even kindness, a thoroughly honest, singularly intelligent, and also affectionate man whom in the distance I esteem more than perhaps he ever knew. Seldom did I speak to him, but hardly ever without learning and gaining something. I would like to conclude with a few words about Lockhart's methods as a biographer, and to comment particularly on the controversial conclusion to the life of Scott. I know Peter Garside is working on an article about this, and I don't want to tread on his territory, but I think it is important for the Lockhart-Scott relationship. Lockhart writes that four days before Scott's death, Scott rallied briefly and called for Lockhart. Lockhart, Scott said, I may have but a minute to speak to you. My dear, be a good man, be virtuous, be religious, be a good man. Nothing else will give you any comfort when you come to lie here. 
modern critics have been dismissive of this scene, arguing that it was concocted by Lockhart. Yet I think it conveys a truth about Scott and Lockhart, even if it did not happen exactly as Lockhart represented it. In reviewing Lockhart's Burns, Thomas Carlyle argues that with all its deficiencies, the work gives more insight into the true character of Burns than any prior biography. And on the life of Scott, Carlyle writes, if Mr. Lockhart is fairly chargeable with any radical defect, it seems even to be in this, that Scott is altogether lovely to him, that Scott's greatness spreads out for him on all hands beyond reach of eye, that his very faults become beautiful, and of his worth there is no measure. Carlyle raises the issue of Lockhart's practice as a biographer, which was to represent a character. Lockhart's training as a biographer came in part, I think, as a fiction writer. And for Lockhart, in terms of form and style, there is little distinction between the purpose of biography and the purpose of the novel. Lockhart began his Burns in 1825, the year after he published his fourth novel, put it aside, returned to it in 1827, and then published it in 1828. Lockhart had published his four novels in the four years immediately before he began his Burns, and his novel titles read like titles of biographies. Valerius, Adam Blair, Reginald Dalton, Matthew Wald. In 1826, he published a review of Walter Scott's Lives of the Novelists, in which he argued that the task of the novelist is, above all, to excel in the conception and delineation of character. We read no fiction twice, Lockhart continues, that merely heaps description upon description and weaves incident with incident, however cleverly. The imitating romancer shrinks at once into his proper dimensions when we ask, what new character has he given us? Lockhart relied heavily on personal recollect recollections and anecdotes from people who knew his subjects, and his image-making biography also meant that he did not write all he knew about his subject's character, especially if there were living relatives who might be hurt or offended by the disclosure of family secrets or negative images. For Lockhart, the conception and delineation of character was the primary focus of biography, and the image was more important than strict accuracy in presenting facts. For example, in the life of Scott, Lockhart tells the story of William Mingus as looking towards North Castle Street from his residence in George Street and seeing a hand, unwearied, writing night after night, a hand that turns out to be Scott's at work on Waverly. However, William Mingus wrote to Lockhart after reading the anecdote in the life of Scott. I perfectly well recollect the incident of the hand, though I am afraid you have embellished it a little. Some literary grub criticizing the works of Lockhart some 50 years hence might accuse him of inaccuracy and in support of his charge, proved that in 1812, W.M.'s only uncle was in India, and that the said W.M. did not reside in George Street before Whit Sunday, 1818. In the summer of which year, I imagine the hand alluded to took place. The anecdote, however, is so well introduced where it stands as to make the anachron anachronism of no consequence. I recognize that this manipulation of facts to create an image is a touch ironic, given that after reading Old Mortality when it was first published, Lockhart privately asserted that Scott had committed gross violations of historical truth. But Scott had admonished Lockhart to be a good man from the time they first met, and it is not too far-fetched to accept, to accept that Scott's last words to Lockhart whenever they might have occurred, or in whatever form they took, would have been an encouragement to be a good man. For Lockhart, though, I believe this representation of Scott's last words, ultimately, was intended as a tribute to Scott, a statement about the kind of man Scott was, and I think, under Scott's influence, 
the kind of man Lockhart became. Thank you. very kindly is prepared to answer questions. So if anybody has any, could you let us know? There's, uh, there's, I've got one. Yeah, there's one here, one there, and one there. Yeah. All of the characters you mentioned in Lockhart, Snuff Light, were yeah. very prominent. Can you speak yes. up a bit? Is that everybody can you Sorry? Up? Could you oh. speak up a little? Yes, certainly. Thank no you. problem at all. So. <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of the characters that you mentioned in your talk were William Lockhart's life. I know for a fact a lot of them were Enlightenment figures in Scotland and were also Freemasons as well. But was Lockhart a Freemason? He was, yes. I thought that was. <laughs> Um, that was a fascinating discourse. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with Dr. Harriet Wood's latest book on Lockhart, Lockhart um, yes. where she feels that the somewhat she feels the reputation he enjoys today is somewhat unfair, and that um, a lot of that he was made the scapegoat for a lot of the literary criticism which came out at the time, and he was mainly vindictive in his in his twenties. But subsequently, he toned down, perhaps because of Scott. Uh, what is your view that actually he was made the scapegoat and that hostile biographers picked up on that? Um, Did people hear that question? Yes, I, I think that um, Lockhart has suffered uh, in his reputation because in modern uh, criticism, particularly, focused on I mean, the, the reputation of John Keats, for example, to modern scholars, or to William Hazlitt, uh, for example, who's also a, a, a victim of uh, Wilson and Lockhart's uh, pen and, and Blackwood's. Um, so that the, the, the focus of uh, attention on a very small number of articles uh, has I think stayed with, with Lockhart. And as I mentioned, I think he was partly responsible for that by giving himself uh, the name of the scorpion in, in the Chaldee manuscript after um, it, it could have been very quiet. But the, the scorpion reputation of Lockhart uh, and then uh, with, with his partner in crime, really, John Wilson, who wrote the most vicious of, of the articles, I think, uh, in the long term in, in Blackwoods. Um, he, he, Lockhart's had a difficult time getting over that. So I think, it, I think it has been unfair that he has not been seen for his full reputation as a writer, that the, the full body of his work really has not been available. One of the difficulties, of course, has been that uh, most of what he wrote was published anonymously. Um, and with Blackwood's Magazine, uh, many of the articles were written by more than one hand. And so you have two or three authors uh, who are contributing to a particular essay or to uh, something like the Noctes Ambrosiani, this series of fictitious conversations, which also have some venom from time to time. Uh, as well. And so by association, as much as by identifying what was actually Lockhart's, uh, Lockhart has, has suffered. And so I hope that uh, when um, I've done a lot of work with uh, uh, Lockhart's letters and trying to identify what Lockhart's, uh, beyond the work that had been done by somebody like Alan Strout uh, with Blackwoods Magazine Bibliography. Uh, so I hope that getting Lockhart's works in scholarly editions before the public will enable people to see, I think, his, his true place in the history of Romantic and early Victorian writing. Yes? I can sell your books out. Sorry. <laughs> um, Dr. Richardson and I met by chance at uh, Bow Hill at the wonderful musicale 
um, a month ago, and by chance I was set to accompany you on the way back. Right. And you said very quietly, I said, I thought, a book, I said, I don't know that book, the Adam, but in fact, this is the Adam Blair, and Mr. Ian Campbell sitting here has done a good fraction of it. I must say, a wee bit of had to actually find it, because it was done in 2007, <coughs> in Lane Quiet since 1822. Um, I must say, it's very much in the theme, uh, now much forgotten, about what important roles the minister of Scottish life um, was beset by so many moral problems in society. And that's exactly what um, Lockett and uh, Son of the Manse gets into. Right. It's, I have the other comment, uh, comment though, there. The next book I read after this was John Buchan's Which Would, <laughs> and the very recent paperback of it, Would You Believe, has a portrait of somebody you might think is a divine and funded it. But in fact, this, um, the frontispiece is in fact John Lockett's portrait. Oh. <laughs> I will get you this book too. The thing about which would is that it too is a story about of an earlier covenanting time when the minister Scott sort of enlightened ones got the conscience going one way and their involvement and actions going another way. This sort of split that often happens in enlightened Scott. So Buckingham too, a son of the man, loved his, uh, Walter, uh, loved his Walter Scott and wrote his biography. I think that also um, um, but I think uh, probably Buckingham's got it for the better story writing. Um, there's a wonderful tale in the beginning of your Adam Blair about the um, Blair um, taking a West Coast sail up the Western Isles. It's absolutely a tourist, well written piece. But some of the stuff at the back end is a wee bit heavy and sad. But uh, if anybody would care for a look afterwards uh, at it, and was welcome to it, and uh, I would never have known, but for this traveler from abroad. Mr. Uh, if I can follow up with that, thank you for mentioning Adam Blair. I'll put in a plug for the first volume in the uh, Edinburgh critical edition of the works of John Gibson Lockhart will be a new edition of Adam Blair, which should be out about the end of the year uh, by Edinburgh University Press. And it's, um, Lockhart published two editions. His first edition was in 1822, and that's the one that Ian Campbell has uh, edited. Uh, and, and that introduction to that edition um, that uh, Eric has just shown you is probably about the best single thing written about Adam Blair uh, that I know. So I'll put in a plug for that. Uh, but the edition that I'm editing is based on the second edition, which was extensively revised, and Lockhart uh, had uh, made many revisions, particularly focusing on his style after getting some good advice, particularly from Henry McKenzie. And so I think the second edition really is a, is a better novel stylistically, and I'm looking forward to having that one back in print uh, as well. So I commend both of them to you. Great. We've now sadly run out of time, but there will be drinks outside and plenty of opportunity to talk to Tom. Can I now ask David Purdy to come and do the vote of thanks, please? Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, a great pleasure always to uh, receive one of our academic colleagues from the other side um, of, of the water. And thank you very much for coming to us and giving us such an interesting uh, and well-balanced, if I may say so, uh, review of the life of, of John Gibson Lockhart. Um, this remarkable son of the man, as you pointed out, who fluent in six modern languages and two of the three ancient ones, Snell Exhibitioner to Balliol, which I wanted to do myself, it was denied for uh, lack of talent, <laughs> <laughs> but then who went on to this extraordinary career, which you have very well-balancedly um, uh, reviewed for us. Um, excellent in matter and manner. Um, you may not be aware, and you didn't mention the Speculative Society of Edinburgh, of which several of us here are members. And maybe some of our own members are not aware of what happened to Gibson Lockhart, who criticized the society in Peter's letters to his kinsfolk to a degree which, which, which infuriated the society, which immediately had a debate and decided that the painting of JGL 
which faced the society should be turned to the wall <laughs> without limit of time. And then a month later, thinking, and this is a great legal society as well as a scientific one, that, that, that justice must be tempered with mercy, another debate took place in the halls of the spec, and it was decided that we had been hasty and that the painting of John Gibson Lockhart should be turned back to face the society on every centenary of his death. <laughs> <laughs> so, indeed it was turned back in, in 1954 uh, to face the society and will be re, uh, re, uh, re reverted in 2054 when some of us may or may not be there to observe it. But thank you very much also for referring to in some detail to his work with the, uh, the Quarterly Review, editing for 28 years. And although Gibson Lockhart has had such criticism from some of us here, two of us here tonight are editors of the Burns Encyclopedia, uh, who were critical perhaps of some of the statements made by, by Lockhart about the poet, because he didn't go to Ayrshire or to Galloway or to Dumfries to check out on a field visit. He there repeated in his biography of Burns, I'm afraid to say, many of the canards that had been set out by, by previous biographers. However, he did particularly stimulate, I think you mentioned, the essay by Carlyle, which was perhaps the first great literary essay about the poet, pointing out that his songs, as opposed to his poetry, were one of his greatest legacies, and that many of his songs could be read as poetry, uh, most unusually. But to, to finish with the balance which you struck tonight, well done, was the fact that when he was editor of the Quarterly Review, he steered the review to remarkable times in our country, to the Catholic Emancipation Act, to the, uh, to, to the, the Great Reform Bill of 1832, to the repeal of the Corn Laws. And he kept that magazine away from the faction fighting on both sides. He had that tremendous ability to, uh, to remove it from faction fighting. He was dispassionate, much as David Hume was, as criticized by, or rather, rather commended by Voltaire for his dispassionacy, for his ability to see both sides of the question. So well done tonight. Thank you for coming to us. On behalf of all of us, thank you very much for that lecture. Thank you. I would just like to give you this, which is a collection of speeches by previous presidencies. Quite a nice collection. It was edited, I think, by Peter. Was and, it? Ian, and Ian. And, and Ian. Ian. Sorry. <laughs> Peter Garza and Ian Campbell. Thank you very Great. much. Well, thank you Appreciate so much. Thank you. I'm sorry, we are going to go and have our glass of wine in a minute. There are just a couple of little things. The next newsletter with the autumn program and the appropriate application form will go out by email tomorrow and with and then by post over the next week so you should have that soon and I would just like to remind you that our next event will be the lunchtime colloquium on the Bride of Lammermoor which had already been advertised and that will take place here in the new club on Saturday the 17th of August and it will be included in the program you will shortly receive and I think now it's time for our drink. Mm -hmm. <laughs>